Good evening. I will now call the special meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education to order. Pursuant to KRS Chapter 61, notice is hereby given that on September 11th, 2020, the chair of the Fayette County Board of Education called a special meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, September 14th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. The Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will conduct a virtual meeting on Monday, September 14th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. This will be a virtual meeting streamed online. The link for the meeting is fcps.net slash virtual meeting. This is the board's monthly planning meeting, but is specially called because it is conducted virtually. Please be advised in the state of a proclaimed national emergency and under a similar declaration by the governor, it is not currently feasible for the board to provide meeting room conditions in the face of COVID-19, a highly contagious virus that spreads between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet. Under these exceptional circumstances in which the Commonwealth of Kentucky is confronting a worldwide pandemic while nevertheless needing to accomplish critical public business pursuant to KRS 61.840, the Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will not provide a primary physical location for public viewing and will proceed pursuant to KRS chapter KRS 61.826 with concession outline in the Attorney General's opinion OAG 20-05. Thus, the public can address, access the media via the live stream but cannot physically be present at this time. Ms. Daly, will you please call roll? Mr. Raymond Daniels. Present. Mr. Darrell Love. Present. Ms. Christy Morris. Present. Mr. Tyler Murphy. Present. Ms. Stephanie Spires. Present. Thank we you. We do need to amend the agenda and do a couple business items, but we have a special guest who has another meeting this evening. So I want to turn it over to the superintendent um, to begin his superintendent's report with our guests, and then we'll come back and actually approve the agenda and everything for the evening. So Superintendent Cop, please take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Board. And we are pleased to have with us an honor, uh, Dr. Craig Humball with the Lexington um, Health Department to give us an update on COVID-19. Dr. Humball, turn it over to you and thanks again. Great, thank you so much uh, for putting me at the beginning of the agenda. Our own Board of Health meets the second Monday of every month and our meeting starts at uh, 545, so I will be brief, but I appreciate the invitation to ask me to say a little bit about trends in the pandemic here in Lexington. And I'm assuming that you all will help me advance these slides. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, great. So again, thank you so much for the chance to work with you all and for what the district is doing to limit the spread of the virus. That has been our goal from the beginning is to slow the progression of COVID-19 so that the sickest residents can get the care that they need and have the hospital beds and the staff to take care of and the ventilators that they need. So. Um, I first want to start out and say that um, we passed a couple of milestones this past week. We've had uh, over 7,000 cases in Fayette County residents since the pandemic began. And the second milestone is that we have now passed the six month mark in terms of when cases began. So we are now moving into the next six months of the pandemic. And here you can see um, these are the numbers of cases that we've had with the rolling seven day average. Um, and these are cases by date of report. And, and this is only Lexington residents. Uh, so that's, this is the Lexington Fayette County Health Department and our jurisdiction is only Lexington residents. So I wanna make that clear, but you can certainly see that the numbers of cases on the face of it continue to rise here in Fayette County. Next slide, please. And this is a similar slide, but this shows the number of cases um, by date of onset or if they have not been symptomatic um, by the date of their specimen collection. Again, we see an increase, although not as steep in the last month or so. We also see that university students um, for the last month or so are making up 40 to 50, they're comprising 40, to 50% of all of our um, most recent case cases. Um, and this is probably not surprising because universities opened in person to students, um, many of them about a month ago, five to six weeks ago. There, um, there are students who have returned to in-person classes, they're living and studying in closer quarters. Um, and uh, we also have 30,000 more people here in Lexington living here that we did 
um, before, um, let's say, August 1st. And also they are doing surveillance testing, routine surveillance testing, at least at the beginning of the school year. So um, this, is, uh, this is what we're seeing in terms of the caseload. It is increasing, but we are seeing more cases due to university students than we have um, during the previous five months of the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, this is our current instance rate in Kentucky, and a lot of people use this metric um, in terms of where are we uh, in terms of spread, and we're what we call an orange county, so we have a uh, current incidence rate of about 15 cases per 100,000 residents each day. Uh, that's the orange. You can see if you know where Fayette County is. Um, and that's accelerated spread. And we have alternated between community spread and accelerated spread, but most recently we've been at the accelerated spread mark in terms of this, this particular metric. Next slide. So I wanted to give you some idea about cases, uh, case rates in different age groups. Uh, and again, this is reported case rates, uh, and you can see it because of uh, increasing in the university population that we have uh, higher case rates in our 20 to 24, but we also have high case rates in the, in the teenage group as well. Um, so uh, on the other hand, and we'll get into this, hospitalizations increase with age. Next slide, please. So I thought it might be instructive for you all to see the epidemic curve of just cases that are school age. So what we did was to parse out um, cases in Fayette County uh, since the beginning of the pandemic among five to 17 year olds. Uh, and again, these are only Fayette County residents and we will assume that most of these um, children are school children. They could be homeschooled they could be going to private or parochial schools, or they could be attending Fayette County Public Schools. And you can see that uh, we have had an increase over the summer, so in June and July, among um, children of school age in terms of cases, but then for the last month or so, uh, that has leveled off. So that gives you an idea about school age children and uh, numbers of cases over time that we're seeing here in Lexington. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to point out that uh, that about 20% of our cases are in this age group that we would consider to be school age. Uh, and again, that's over the entire pandemic of the 7,200 cases that we've seen. And I've Put that in the, in the little red box. Next slide, please. But when we look at these folks, they have very low hospital numbers of hospitalizations. So these are kids, and you can see we've had very few hospitalizations and no deaths. That's not to say that I'm not going to tell you that there's not going to be the outlier of a child who's going to do poorly with COVID-19. And for that child, it's 100%. But I'm also saying that the data would suggest, and this is similar to other places in the country, that most children do very well with this disease. Um, they have mild symptoms to, to, to some, in some cases, no symptoms. I've also put a box around the 64, I'm sorry, the above 65 year age groups. And you can see that um, they make up uh, almost 50% of our hospitalizations and 80%, over 80% of our deaths. So again, the older that you are, and we can talk about chronic conditions as well, but in general, the older you are, the more, more likely you are to do poorly and the more likely you are to die from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this kind of goes along with the previous slide in the sense that 
um, I wanted to show uh, by age group how many cases, how, what percentage of our cases are asymptomatic at the time of the initial interview. Now, we have that data. We don't know if they go on to be symptomatic at all. But you can see that around 30% or so of our school-aged children, about a third of our school-aged children, um, are asymptomatic at the time of the initial interview when we're talking to the parents or the guardians about their disease. Um, that's why it's been so challenging that this, this particular disease is not necessarily playing by the lesson plan. You can see by the data that we have a very wide range of disease from asymptomatic to death. And this is why it's very difficult for us to continue to control the disease um, because we do have such a wide range. Yes, most of our children are doing very well. Unfortunately, they are able to potentially spread um, to family members or to staff who are older, who may have chronic disease, and to, who may um, have poorer outcomes with COVID-19. Um, I really just had 10 minutes because I need to get to my next meeting. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time really for questions. I'm happy to come back in a at a future board meeting and talk more about the data, but uh, hopefully this helps to set your stage for your discussions uh, Superintendent Kalk uh, for this particular board meeting. Definitely appreciate it, Dr. Humball. And I know the board does as well. Any time with you, it's valuable time. So we definitely appreciate and look to having you back, um, hopefully on the, on the perhaps the 28th. All right. Thanks for your partnership, folks. We Thank appreciate you. it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. And I, um, if any of you were privy to catching the um, governor's press conference today, you would have seen the chart that Dr. Humball had shared with the four color codes. In our reimagining, re-envisioning, reimagining, renewing um, back to school uh, guidance for 2020-2021, we looked at community spread. We looked at uh, green, yellow, red, and being specific about what sort of instructional model we would employ based on those those colors or those groupings. When you looked at the, you know, listened to the press conference uh, today, you would have heard about the four colors um, that were displayed. And if you could bring up that the map, uh, go back to Dr. Humball's slide presentation. Thank you. And bring up, yeah, that's it. And could you increase it, make it larger a little bit? Excellent. So you see here what the state has done um, in looking at incidence rates. And it's green, yellow, orange, and red. And what the state has done is the health department has provided additional guidance as to uh, the instructional uh, model or mode uh, that districts and uh, should be considering local boards based on each color. So essentially, if it's green or yellow, you should be looking at the healthy at school uh, guidance provided by KDE. And for us, we have green and yellow. So we know what that looks like based on our back to school a guidance document as well, a back to school plan. When it gets to orange and red, there's specific um, guidance there as well. Um, but it's more open to local uh, boards of education, um, local communities as to what that looks like in terms of hybrid, um, virtual um, learning experiences for students. So we'll come back to that. My team and I are going to meet and digest what we just shared at the press conference. Uh, but that's something that we'll pick up with on the, the 28th. Right now, and again, I think it's important to note that we are orange. And that's accelerated for Fayette County. And I'll stop there and see if Lisa, who also I know is a partner with me, 
uh, who watched the press conference. You want to add anything? Uh, no, sir. That was that was a great um, summary of what was shared. And there's also a, a, a superintendent's web call tomorrow that will give us the opportunity to ask additional questions. That will and they did mention the um, positivity rate, which is uh, below six. So you look at the positivity rate below six, and then you look at this chart. Um, and they also have reporting. Um, obviously, it goes back to what the governor said, that any student or um, employee who tests positive, the, dish, the school has in district 24 hours to share that information as a way to inform the public in real time, make it transparent. You know, that's something that certainly we uh, feel is necessary and needed, something we've been doing since uh, the beginning um, as, as COVID-19 cases appeared uh, in our schools amongst our students and, and our, our employees. We've been informing the health department, um, sending letters home, which eventually informed the public um, because our local media picked it up, and I thank them for that. So we've been in that sort of routine and process um, since the beginning. All so right, with that one, said. One thing, sir, that was new today in, in the oh, emergency. The parents. Yes. Please. The emergency, the emergency order that was um, released today does require that parents or family members report any positive cases of their children and that is a new requirement um asking families to be up, to be up front and to they, giving them i think a 24-hour window to do that as well so that in the past we've been working closely with the health department they've been excellent partners but sometimes there has been a lag in getting those reports back from the labs with so many labs involved and this puts the onus on the family to alert the school so that we can take immediate action. All right. And, and Lisa, just to make sure I'm clear, you're talking about the family being required to report back to the district or to the school, the direct school? The wording says to the school, which then means that we will have a process in place to ensure that those numbers become you know are reported up the line so that we're because the district is the one that's working directly with the health department to take that lift off of our, our school level administrators and the parents will have access to their school's data is that correct that's correct as well cool it will be on their website for so the parents can can see if a case if things start to spread that's correct it's a dashboard that, that, that the state hey, has is there anybody currently that's open right now in person that has a dashboard already using one that we know of other districts yeah any district in the state of kentucky that's using a dashboard similar to what i'm aware of sir it, well, I, believe well, he I would, that there uh, were, but he didn't identify which schools they were during the press conference he said that some schools were already doing it but he didn't identify them yeah but the state's dash, it's going to be very similar to the state. I mean, the state's going to have the uh, the dashboard. And so you want to make sure you have that information so it's not to confuse families uh, as to the data that's there. And so the, the dashboard and the data that will be um, housed in the State Department Public Health um, may um, reflect different figures. And he said, that's okay. You know, maybe one one student off, maybe seven positive student cases at this school, but then the state health department has eight, et cetera. Um, but as long as you report and get that information in good faith. But the, the requirement, as you recall, the governor said, uh, going back in um, early September on or about um, after that if a student tests positive, you have 24 hours of staff to inform the public. And that's always been a, a, a um, requirement uh, since that time on schools. What this does, Lisa's right, it says to families, if your child tests positive within 20, you have 24 hours to notify the school. 
And Superintendent Cobb, is that a notification that has to take place even now that we're virtual or are we talking about when we resume some sort of in-person? It would take effect on the 28th, regardless, okay. irrespective of the mode of instruction that a district is, is engaged in. Okay. And so they would have to let us know um, as, to, as to their child. Uh, and again, then we turn that over to the um, to the health department. Um, certainly, inform our community, etc. Um, contact tracing, everything that goes with it. And so, you know, it's important um, one to make sure that we have accurate information to make decisions as we go forward. Um, and as for the chart with the green, yellow, orange, red designation. Encourage to look at that every Thursday um, at 8 p.m. because it could change weekly. But it gave us a specific date and time to look at that. We've been orange, and, and Lisa and I have been tracking it. Um, we, we've been a steady orange, uh, bright orange, if you will, um, in terms of our incidents here in Fayette County. So, with that said, I want to. Uh, stop there and then say, Madam Chair, I could turn it over to you to pick up and do the amend the agenda, etc. And then you turn it back over to me and we can go through the other presentations or you want me to continue. What's your what's your preference? And if we can just clarify while we're waiting on the chair uh, for families that we're still committed to kind of that that window of time that we've talked about before with uh, notification. So it won't be a situation like if on Thursday, all of a sudden, say it's green, we're going to go back to school on Friday or that Monday. Um, you know, we're, we're still looking at letting people, giving folks enough notice um, to, to, to make those decisions. It wouldn't be that quick of a turnaround. Board Member Murphy, um, excellent point uh, to underscore families. We're not going to do the yo-yo. Um, it's just, um, and we, and we couldn't kind of turn around and pivot, um, that quickly, unless it's an incident where there is that spread and we need to close the school because of there's an, there's an issue. Um, that's something that we, we would have to do quickly. That's a little different. Uh, but we would be looking at, um, if we're orange and let's say we're, um, let's say we're yellow because Dr. Humboldt said we were yellow, you know, at, at um, some earlier point, and we were doing hybrid, and then you had an incident at a school, um, and widespread that we had to immediately uh, switch to NTI 2DL. We should be able to do that and pivot and get the school clean and slowly try to come back online based on um, the, the, the quarantine, the 14 day period, everything that has to pass in order to um, say that that school is safe again uh, to resume some form of in-person learning. I'm sorry, Board Member Murphy, were you finished with your question? Yes. Okay, um, and Board Member Spires, just want to make sure, I think this is a good topic and there are some questions that of course a lot of folks have emailed us about and if we're going to bring this up after we've done the formal adoption of the uh, agenda, I'm okay with that, but if you want me to continue, I will, okay, here's what I would like to do. I would like to ask the questions pertaining to this topic now. Then we will go in and adopt the agenda with a couple of, of modifications. Um, but one thing real fast before you jump in, I want to elaborate on what Tyler said. When we met previously, Superintendent Cock, we said kind of approximately like a two-week turnaround. Because like if we met like on the 28th and we decided it would probably be after fall break and we've tied it in to our breaks and such like that. There is um, some rumors and some emails I got today that said a month from when we decided. And so I want to kind of just make sure that when I said that's not what we said at our board meeting, that I'm accurate. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, we're looking at the 28th. And mm -hmm. again, and that's in that four to six week uh, window that we um, placed in our back to school Right. plan that we're going to be consistent with um, and revisiting. And as you can see, 
with this sort of heat map, you have to constantly come back and right. look because, you know, it's a, uh, um, you know, we, we, we look every in the flu season. Um, I was under the weather, so you got flus, you got the allergies, but then you also have COVID, which doesn't appear to be responding to any sort of uh, seasonality, if you will. When we bring forward a decision on the 28th, um, depending on the, or the recommendation, depending on the board's approval, um, we would look for implementation uh, within that two week, two and a half week window. Okay. That's what I just want to make sure, because today I heard that four week a few times, and I didn't want people to think like if we made a decision in December or um, the 28th, it wouldn't be going to like the week of Halloween. So I, and I know that was frustrating parents. I'm not sure where that rumor got started, but I wanted to well, dispel that. No, no, I appreciate that. But again, um, you, you know, we're, you know, I, I think Dr. Stack said, or uh, someone mentioned uh, during a press conference that UK is larger than in terms of, I guess, the students and, and, and the employees than some of the counties. Right. Well, we're, we're pretty large enterprise as well. Right. right. So it, it's going to take some time. We have our, you know, and, and for us, it's it's our, you know, the transportation, et cetera. There's a lot to get moving, a lot of moving parts. And you want to move with deliberate speed because you're dealing with someone's health. And again, I'd rather deal with learning loss than a loss of life. And I know we've been focusing on the uh, students and, and the um the immune system of our of our children is strong and resilient, but that's not who's teaching them, right? And so I got to balance that with our employees. That's not who's transporting them, and I got to balance that with our employees, our bus drivers, bus monitors, child nutrition workers, teachers, paraeducators. They have one life. And so we want to make sure that we have everything in place in our schools and, and processes, um, in those school plans, which I'm confident, you know, that we do, we're working on, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's, it's um, judicious to go, to go slow, to go fast. But I think what you're saying is we are going to deliberate speed. And that's what I wanted to communicate to parents, that we're not just going to make a decision and then sit for a month and not do anything. And even right now, while we're not in the classroom, our our facilities team has been doing phenomenal things, you know, getting the schools ready, getting the classrooms ready, getting hand washing stations by the, on the buses, um, getting the PPE in, getting the cleaning supplies in. And so I just want people to know we're not just sitting around that our staff and our administration and everyone is actively preparing for when students do return to the classroom safely. Well, so Madam Chair, you hit on one thing. People don't know what they don't know. Right. And we have a problem of people not knowing in our community that we've got to do something about. And uh, Superintendent Cough, I don't know how you want to attack this, but we, we have a massive communication slash miscommunication slash lack of information problem. And it, to me, the schools are trying to do what they can at the school level uh, to direct to the parents, but we've got to do something significant at the district level to help educate our, all of our stakeholders, mainly our parents, but all of our stakeholders of our thought process through this. Everything you just said, everything that's been discussed on this is sound. It's completely sound and logical and reasonable. Unfortunately, um, we haven't communicated that well I'm glad we the governor announced when the government will effectively step out and get out of the way so we can we can plan and, and the onus is on us. But we've got to figure out how to communicate this dashboard process, the color coding of it, what's going on in our community in accordance to cases versus population. Um, so we can get everybody with the guesswork. They're guessing every single day out here and we just got to figure out how to take some of that away. And I think it's just a lot of pent up anxiety um, about, you know, it, and it's, I don't want to get off in all the areas that's causing the pent up uh, anxiety, but it's there. And we just have to do the best that we can to help communicate this process out. And I, I'm, I, you know, for my two cents, uh, and Lisa, I know you're on this line. 
it's 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 much more than one person has the ability and capacity to do uh, because it's a it's such an ongoing messaging onslaught that we have to do that's some of it is digital um, you know some of it is 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 sent through the through the schools from the district I just think we got to figure out I don't know if you put a group of folks together uh, two or three key folks to work with Lisa I, I don't know how you address it I just know it needs to be addressed agreed I think as you um, again, to the governor's press conference, what you had is folks kind of looking and seeing, you know, what's behind the curtain. You know, what what is the calculus that is being considered when making a decision about whether to resume some form of in-person instruction? In the booklet, we talk about community spread, red, yellow, green. What I'm pleased to see um, and learn this afternoon from Dr. Stacks, and I'll learn more tomorrow, is that's what the guidance from uh, the governor's office and the state health department is using a color-coded system in there. Um, underneath each color code, it has specifically sort of what are the options. And so being able to communicate that, you know, here's the options that a local uh, board would consider for orange and red for yellow, for green and yellow, it's using a healthy at school KDE's guidance. And so I think it's folks um, not um, having knowledge as to what are the factors that go into that decision making and being more transparent. And now that we have to follow the, the state um, health department, again, with the dashboard that it go up and you, you, you hit on it, I share that it's ongoing communication not just one and done, et cetera, but continuous communication. Um, and that's something that we have done, I own, and we own as a district. And so looking at maybe an outside um, firm to help us with messaging and, and how to position this based on the information that we received today and receive more information tomorrow. And as you said, the governor mentioned, this is the last time pretty much he's gonna talk about on the 28th, and then that's our time to make a decision and kind of move forward from that point. Well, and to, uh, to board member uh, uh, or Vice Chair Daniel's point, um, communication with the board as well. Um, you know, yes. updating us, especially like after the call with Dr. Stack um, tomorrow. And just that way, so we can uh, keep our constituents informed. We know what to say when they come to us with questions and we're all on the same page. To let folks know that you know this is and we've said this from the beginning the virus the pandemic is driving a lot of the decision making and there are there are many variables and it's very difficult to you know set very bright lines when we're dealing with all of these variables we have 42,000 students we have you know hundreds of uh, different facilities that we have to think about so um, and employees so uh, it's a multifaceted decision making process and uh, it's difficult to turn that around very quickly as we're also responding to data in real time. Agreed. Um, you know, first of all, I was just gonna say for all our listening audience and for our parents and our families, um, we have heard you. I mean, the emails, and I know sometimes um, the responses of trying to respond back to everybody that emails us, I know the board members are really trying to make sure we get a response back. Um, but I will tell you, uh, you know, superintendent, what people are really talking about. And I mean, it's interesting because my board members can attest, we have individuals that are weighing in on both sides. I want to resume and I want to stay back at home because of the safety aspect. So I think as we, as a board team and as a district, we've always been one to try to listen to our community, look at and try to make the best decisions. And I know we are, we are committed to doing that. And I guess one of the challenges, uh, Superintendent, that we're hearing from a lot of folks, and I think board member um, Daniels kind of hit on to it, it's the when and it's the how. Okay, so there's so much information um, that's out there, period. And people are you know, spreading information that may be true, et cetera. But I think we really have to, when people say, well, when are we gonna return? What is the factor um, that we're gonna use to make that? And I'll just throw these some questions out just for you and your team to think about, you know, what will be the options for our families um, who do not want to return to in person, um, even if we have a hybrid type of situation and they didn't opt into um, FLA, I mean, L, I mean, BLA uh, from that perspective. And so those are some of the, I think, the things that are some of our families are grappling with 
um, and how do we deal with this? And so, you know, I again, I know all of us realize that true success, true learning happens in the classroom. And we're committed to being able to get our kids back into that in-person learning. But, you know, I said before, and a lot of people have slammed me on it, but how do we do it safely? And that's the most important thing is we kind of transition. And I think the point is made, um, even though we put some timelines out there, I think it's important for people to understand that you and the team are looking at this and you are thinking about some of the plans of how that's going to resume and what is that going to look like? Um, you know, in terms of being able to make that transition back to in-person learning. So I, that, those are some of the things I think our community and some of our families are dealing with. And, um, you know, I think we want to know and let you know that we are sensitive to and we are listening and hearing you guys loud and clear. Excellent. Well, and to end to board, to build off of board member love, um, I, th I do think that we need to be using this time while we are in NTI2DL to be uh, preparing for those contingencies because we d very well may have families who, you know, at the time uh, that they had to make the decision about B BLA, they opted to stay in their home school through NTI2DL. We're going to have staff who may not be comfortable returning uh, when that decision is made to in-person instruction. So um, one of the things I would like the board to see as well is kind of where we are in that planning process, what contingencies are in place for staff who opt out, uh, what can, do we have a, a third avenue for families who may not have jumped into the BLA when it was available? And uh, when the decision comes down, they may not be comfortable going to in-person. So do, do we have some extended NTI2DL model or, you know, so there, there may be some contingencies that we probably didn't think about before that we may need to consider going forward. We couldn't because of our limited resources. So you can't be all things to all people. You have a finite number of educators, paraeducators, et cetera. And so when we put the resources, especially since we're not raising the tax rate, right? And so with that said, we can't run three and four sort of competing models. And so, you know, we'll be um, either you're in some form of in-person or you're in a virtual learning. You know, we can't run, we'll be able to run a companion in-person, you know, elementary, VLA elementary, and then NTI to the, you don't have enough uh, capacity uh, for that. Are, are there considerations for um, a, a phased approach uh, by level? Uh, We're looking at everything, and that's one of the things that, um, we're looking at is a phased in approach. But what I'm saying to you is looking at it horizontally, that if you had in-person elementary, VLA elementary, and a family who wanted NTI 2DL elementary, you don't have enough human capital to be able to offer all three at a high quality level and provide equitable education across the board. Right. So, so you would either be an in in-person or in the virtual learning. The, um, I'm sorry, board member Murphy, were you finished? Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, one of the things that after we, we looked at our situation and decided not to do the hybrid model, um, I thought about it after the fact and I would like to know more about what that would look like. So if a teacher does, you know, Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday, uh, I think if we do go back to that model, we need to do a better job of explaining what te how the teachers are going to handle both the online version and the in-person version. So I think that's a big fear for a lot of teachers. And, and that, for me, I think it sounds like a nightmare as a parent as well. So I just, I'd just like to know more about what you all were envisioning with that. Fantastic. And you're absolutely correct, uh, Board Member Morris, that that's something that would be top of mind for both our um, teachers and, and families. All right. So that, that's a great point. And that's something that we would look for, that we will share with you. Well, I mean, much more. I mean, Board Member Murphy is, is right. It's much more than sharing that with us. You know, as you just explained, it is going to create even more tension in our in our community because quite frankly folks are not trained to understand everything that we're talking about right now 
That's and right. so we're, we're going to have to talk about this every single week. Uh, and I, I, I continue to say, I don't know how we do it or what group you get together, but somebody ultimately is going to have to get on a microphone and sit in front of our community on a weekly basis, much like the governor, and give yes. a succinct update on everything that we're considering and talking about. And of course, we need to be abreast of that uh, and included in that conversation. But uh, we, we've got to talk. We have we have a, we have enough weeks ahead of us to really get our folks ironed out on the questions that are going to come. And we shouldn't have anybody in our community that has a question two or three weeks from now, as far as what are we thinking about, what it's going to look like, uh, what happens if rates go up, all of those kind of questions that uh, Board Member Love was throwing out there. We, we've got to, we just, we have to over-educate and over-communicate with our community at this point. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you very much. And just to reiterate, um, you know, definitely, um, you know, I think there's some great points were made about communication. And part of it is that we all need to be in the loop on communication. So we're all sending the same messaging and saying the same things. Um, and that we all have up to date, accurate information, because I think it's very confusing when we hear things second, third and fourth hand. Um, and like, um, you know, I think Christy is a very good question that families just need, you know, and I think her question was great in the sense that really what she asked is, what are you thinking? It's not, this is what it's going to be but letting people know what we are thinking and letting people know that we are thinking, because I think there's some thought if we don't even communicate what we're thinking, that we're not thinking and that we aren't running these scenarios. And as, as um, um, Mr. Daniel said, I mean, a lot of this is being driven by anxiety and by fear and, you know, not knowing. And, you know, a lot of us moms and dads and grandparents are planners and we're trying to plan out, you know, I know we have, um, you know, I've had letters from nurses who are like, you know, I'm trying to do my December schedule and I don't know what it would look like. My boss wants me to know what it will look like. So I think the more we can communicate and, and knowing that we will pivot and we will shift, but just being transparent through the process is huge. Um, so I wanted to ask a quick point of clarification. We had asked for an addition to the board, um, um, we had asked for an agenda item on classwork that does not appear to be on the agenda as, as well. Were you going to include that in your superintendent's report or do we also need to add that to the agenda? On classwork? Yes, we wanted to just discuss something for a moment. Um, and so since I'm thinking you, um, what did I title it? Hold on, I'm going back through all my notes. <laughs> While you're looking for that, can I go back to yeah. um, just a go couple on. things real quick to clarify? Um, I think we had asked about this before, and I just wanted to follow up on it. Uh, have we discussed use of school facilities in the interim while we're closed? Um, is that like opening up to small groups? Is it Has that come up before? We have talked have about we made any progress on that? We have talked about it. Um, considering we're in the window at four to six weeks, where, where the board would be deciding uh, based on a recommendation from the district on the 28th. We decide to focus on getting our schools uh, prepared um, and, and do everything that's needed. Um, and that standpoint to make sure they're clean and sanitized, et cetera. And okay. so we wanted to use our resources for that purpose. And, and then you, see, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. And then see what the decision is on the 28th. And then based on that decision, then either pick up with that conversation or move forward with the recommendation. Okay, so just to clarify, so everyone is clear, what, what we're looking at tonight is, we're, is not making a decision about returning on the 28th. We're talking about on the 28th, the regular school board meeting, hearing a discussion about returning to in-person instruction after that. So, so the early, the earliest return date would not be September 28th. It would be that would that put us after fall break then? Just so, just so we can, just so families understand the conversation that's happening tonight. That's correct. That's what we committed to in our back to school plan. What healthy at school was looking at that four to six week window, and then making that decision going into fall break, and so that we had chance or an opportunity to then. Um, 
move forward with any decision, um, considering, you know, the reasonableness of what we needed to do to, you know, be able to implement that decision. Okay. And so and that that's why was this. Oh, go ahead. No, that's why it's very intentional. So when we said our 28th, and you can see it's in the booklet, and all of a sudden the governor says the 20, like everybody's using this 28th date um, became so important. It was already important to us. Mm -hmm. um, and now it seems to be a date that's important across the Commonwealth, which is, uh, which is uh, fine by me. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense. So on the 28th, and we'll have more, we'll have two weeks uh, more data, worth of more data. Exactly. And then at the 28th, the board can come together and in the context of that new information uh, and more recent information, we can have a discussion about a possible return after fall break just so folks can understand the timeline. That's correct. And also, um, again, with the uh, governor's press conference and the, um, the heat map, if you will, that was shared, would be able to, for us to digest that and see what, how that impacts or informs our decision, but also be able to share that with the, with the board um, and, and the community as well. So we had a chance to kind of process that because that's just information that was uh, presented uh, this afternoon. Thank which you. We'll learn more about tomorrow during the superintendent's um, webcast. Excellent. And if you could just send the board after that call, just kind of a bulleted memo of just some of the highlights. If it's different from what we heard today, that would be great. Will do. Do you expect that we'll be able to comply with uh, our reporting a little bit earlier than the 28th? I know he's, he recommended that we that all the schools start by the 28th, but do you think that we would have access to that data earlier than that? I'm not sure that was, I'm not sure I heard that, that he recommended all schools start by the 28th. You said the governor stated I think that? He stated that, yes, we would have our reporting up on our websites available by the 28th. That's what I heard. Um, did anybody else hear that? Well, there again, I, I didn't hear that. I watched a press conference, but I could be could be wrong, and uh, I'll make sure that um, as we go a little deeper with the health department tomorrow doing superintendent's webcast, see if that's something that um, they can expound upon. I thought the governor said very much what um, Vice Chair Daniel said, and he said on the twenty eighth that you know obviously that's when the reporting. The commitment from or the uh, mandatory reporting from families go into effect that you have to let schools know that if your child tests positive COVID-19 within 24 hours, you must inform the school that they were going to move forward with the heat map before color coded to kind of guide. And that was going to be the last time he talked about it. Right. And that way, you know, as a community, whether or not it's a, you know, the local decision, if it's the accelerator, the orange, or it's the red, um, if the positivity rate goes above six, I think the governor is saying that, you know, that's when they will decide or make a decision. Um, but other than that, here's some guidance for districts. If they're an accelerator and it's orange, here's what you could, you know, here's what that could look like. If it's yellow or green, you're under the healthy at school, and here's what that could look like um, in terms of instructional model. But I will, I will double check. Thank you. And and the way that we, it's also important that the community understands is that that those colors uh, correspond to community behavior, and and it's it's all on us uh, to get us to that yellow and green so that we can return to in-person instruction. It's about wearing masks, it's about washing our hands, it's about social distancing, it's about following all of those things uh, because those colors correspond to the rate of community transmission. So, you know, this is a shared collaborative effort of all of us. You know, we're not, we're not making decisions and acting in a vacuum. Uh, we get to green and yellow by doing our part and, and doing what's, what we've been asked to do to, to reduce the spread. And I think we said that at the outset as to why we start off with NTI to yell. It's because we were rigged when it came to community spread. And so as you know, families have engaged me when it's safe to do so, also challenge and say, you know, it rests upon us. We as the adult 
as the adult actors in our community, uh, must take greater responsibility to making sure that uh, we are taking all the necessary precautions um, and, and safety measures to keep ourselves safe and protect the health and safety of our, our loved ones and others in our community that we may not know and just see in passing as we're going in and out of Lowe's or, or Home Depot, right? And so it's incumbent upon all of us. I, you know, you look at that heat map, you see a lot of yellow. You know, why is Fayette County been, you know, sort of deep orange for a while? It's our behavior. And, and that's an excellent point. And so if we want to get students, more students engaged in in-person learning, let's say more to traditional model, we have to be able to get to that, that yellow to that green. And that's our behavior. And I just want to add one thing, you know, um, we, he, he mentioned the UK students and I have had some emails from people saying, you know, the UK students are outliers, let's pull them out. And that is true to a point. They are the UK students, they, you know, um, but they're a big part of our economy. They are the student teachers in our schools. There are babysitters, there are grocery baggers. They are they are a part of our economy and we do interact with them. Um, and, and so I want to make sure, you know, and I know in my emails, I've said that back to people and they say, oh yeah, that's right. Like I use a babysitter that's a UK student. And so when you really think about it, they're outliers, but they're still a big part of our economy and a big part of our community and we do interact with them. And so they cannot just be completely pulled out of the sample pool. Um, I just want to make sure of that. Do we have any more questions on this topic? I think this is great. We will continue to have discussion. I know the superintendent, we've asked for two reports a week just so that we make sure that the communication that we're, um, that we as board members are giving out is accurate and is reflecting what, um, you know, that we're not days old and we know because things are changing very quickly. Um, and we, we just want to be up to date on what's going on. And, you know, I think Mr. Murphy said, great, if you could kind of update us tomorrow, that would be awesome. Um, so that we um, are in the loop and just communicating the same thing and the, not perpetrating more misinformation because our information is old or, because um, what we learned today, we've all learned could be totally not accurate by Friday. So um, at this time, I need a motion to amend the agenda for the following. I will entertain a motion to amend the agenda by removing consent item H5 and action item I3 and adding under discussion classwork assignments. So do I have? So moved. Thank you. I have a motion by Mrs. Morris, a second by Mr. Murphy. The discussion is that contract was a nursing contract and it's there have been some changes to it. Um, so that's why it's taken off the agenda. There have been some numbers changes and they're reworking it. And then the other one is just something a couple of the board members had mentioned they wanted to just talk briefly to make sure the public knew what our roles and responsibilities are and aren't. Um, so with that said, does all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Um, and real quick, before I turn it back over to the superintendent, I read through all my legal ease really quickly this evening um, because I wanted to get Dr. Hombog on. Um, but I just want to extend a welcome to everybody who's watching us virtually tonight or is watching us um, later this evening. Um, as always, if you have questions, you can continue to reach out to us through our phones and our emails, and we are I'm happy to answer you. As Mr. Love said, we are listening. We are um, reading what you all are sending us. We do recognize that this is challenging and this is difficult. Um, you know, I share in that with many of you. Um, you know, I have four kids doing the NTI thing and, and we have therapies and stuff on top of it. And, um, you know, I think uh, Mr. Murphy made some great points last night when he said, you know, we might be tired and we might be 
worn out and frustrated, but we can't let our frustrations drive our decision making that we really have to um, look at our community and look at this, you know, what our community needs and what the spread is in our community and what we can do to get our kids in the classroom safely. I do think it is the intent of this board um, to get our kids in the classroom when it is safe to do so. Um, and we are hoping that that is sooner rather than later. Um, and I also want to share, you know, um, I just want to say thank you for all the positive comments and the positive feedback that we've gotten from the community as well. Um, there have been some very uplifting stories. Um, but, you know, we know that your kids need to be in the classroom. Um, I tell people, you know, my first grader for the first week, everybody kept asking him, his teacher was nice. And he was like, oh, I don't know. I haven't actually met her. I mean, she seems okay on Zoom. Um, and, you know, then he accidentally actually got to meet her because he was walking and she just happened to be outside and he ran into her. Um, and that is, I think, made the difference because it does make the difference when we have that human to human contact and it does make the difference when we meet people. And so we know that our littles need to be in there in that classroom. And we know that our kids with special needs need to be in the classroom. We know that our gifted kids, we know that everybody needs to be in the classroom. Everybody misses their friends. And so we are listening to everybody. Um, and we are appreciative that you all are watching this evening and that you all are tuned in. And, and we are thankful for your advocacy for your children and for our community. So at this point, I will turn it back over to Superintendent Clark to finish up the superintendent's report. Yeah. Now it's an advocacy on both sides, very much like board member Love said. You know, we have group that supports FCPS, supports NTI, QDL, what we're doing. And obviously uh, the group let them learn. So I really support advocacy on both sides and hearing from our families and that they're both engaged on both sides of the issues. And that's important. Um, and that's how you know you're doing the right work when you make a decision and, and uh, not everybody's in complete agreement, you know, but that's, you know, that's why, that's why we're here in these seats, to make those tough, those tough uh, decisions, uh, but also to make them uh, understanding humanity, to make them with heart, um, to make them thinking about our students first and families, as well as our employees, and making the best decision uh, based on the information that we have available to us. Uh, with that, Sam, get an update on food service, on our meals. Um, and so, Michelle Coker, I'm going to have you uh, come forward and present, Michelle. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening, partner. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Just an update, as you know, we had our summer feeding program from March um, through August 22nd. We did over 600,000 meals. We averaged 3,000 to 3,200 students a day. And then of course in August, we dropped off a little bit and that was anybody 18 years and younger. Next. Then um, on August 26th, we had to return to school under the National School Lunch Program. The first day we had 1,646 students and provided three days worth of meals. The following Monday, we had 1,881 students for two days. And these were just for enrolled students. We got the wonderful email um, on Monday, August the 31st. We were able to return to summer feeding. So we immediately started on September the 2nd. Next slide. Um, summer feeding. <laughs> and so we are averaging over 4,000 um, children a day giving out meals in just the first eight days, which is fantastic. It's even higher than it was last March um, into the summer. Next. So in the works, we are onboarding 16 community sites. We started last week with three sites. This week, um, actually today, we picked up seven more sites. Next week, we will pick up six more for a total of 16. We are partnering with Food Chain and other community partners um, to provide a resource for listing for not only our children in the community, but adults, um, elderly, um, other households who are in need. It's really neat to bring together like a heat map of where resources are, and where the needs are. And then today we also started Hot Meals um, the day of on our pickup sites. Next. Any questions? Michelle, can I have two questions. 
Um, the first is how many students in a normal day in back in, would be on free and reduced lunch in Fayette County? Currently, or as of last year, we ended up with 54% um, in our district free and reduced. So over 20,000 of our 40,000 students qualify for free and reduced. So we're feeding 4,000. That's phenomenal. Where are the other 16,000? But we didn't, we don't feed all free and reduced students. And even all students at CEP sites, we probably do for breakfast, we probably do 33% of the students. And for lunches, we do 65%. Okay. But are we worried that we're missing students? Or do we know where those students are? We, we are, and that's why we're growing our um, community sites and we're expanding those and getting out into those areas where we know there's a higher populations where students or any children can walk up and get a meal. And can you elaborate on how you're partnering with Food Chain? So um, Food Chain, um, Rebecca Self, is she has a uh, tool that she's putting together that includes a variety of entities, churches, um, other United Way, her group, different groups. What they're currently doing now, I was uh, totally surprised of all the suppers and dinners and everything else that's out there, uh, resources for diapers and, and, and wipes and you know, sanitation items. So she is in the process of pulling that all together. Um, we've had a couple of meetings and then we're trying to get that out to all of us who touch families in some form or fashion and provide them that resource tool that they can seek out opportunities and resources. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Michelle, share with the public just some of the, um, the sites we expanded to um, that we are now working um, whether it's uh, like Wood Hill, et cetera, that we expanded to that we're supporting. Okay. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> uh, last week we went to the Wood Hill Center, Pegasus Apartments, and Greg Page Apartments. This week we're expanding out to um, Winter Garden and Snow Road, Kabbalah Run, Benton and Linton, the Bainbridge Drive and Court, the Glen Eagles Apartments on Polo Club. Um, next week, we are venturing out to Hartsbrook and Hill, Hill Rise, uh, Westminster Apartments, Meadow and Gray, Calvin Apartments, the um, oops, got two different lists going on here. What about Coolivan, Michelle? Yes, Coolivan, yes. I said Coolivan, Coolivan. Apartments, yes. Gate House and River Road, a uh, river, uh, Red River and Trent. Did that get all of them? Do you mind to share that list with us just so that I can go back and look at it on a map? Um, yes. Thank you. And Michelle, as you are just kind of reading off these different areas, how do we determine what areas are going to be added? And also, are we in communications with the schools to pick up concerns that individuals or families may have regarding receiving food? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we, um, we started with a group of, of information that were received. That's when we started with our first set of, of sites. And then every other day, um, as my managers get the word out, principals, um, they'll have conversations and they forward me the emails and we're compiling a list of other entities as well. Michelle, could you also get the list of um, who Food Chain is working with? We have a lot of community partners that have want to venture into this, a lot of churches, and I'm sure Rebecca has those churches on her list, but she may have missed one or two, we don't know. Can we get the, that partnership out um, so all the churches that have been calling us that want to get involved with that can jump on board as well? Do you want to have them contact her directly or to go through you? Well, if they could just know that we're that that partnership is getting off the ground. 
um, then they can contact her uh, and I can direct them there. But uh, if we could just let some of those partners know, um, then I can, when they call or email, we can direct them to her. So do you have a specific list right now? You're saying just as they come on board? As they come on board. Okay, okay, great. Board. Yes, we can direct them to her as anybody comes on board. If you have anybody, you can forward them to me um, okay. and I'll be glad to forward them to her as well. All right, awesome. All right. All right, thank you, partner. Thank you. The next one, uh, continue with the technology update. So we we'll ask Mr. Bob Moore to come forward. Good, hang on. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, so I just want to go over a few things. First, student devices. Um, We've gotten about 2,000, sorry, I'm getting some feedback on the, on the presentation here. Um, we've received about 2,000 Chromebooks since the last meeting. Um, we had a, five days of distribution to Virtual Learning Academy students. Um, we've also fulfilled 17 schools' requests. Of those schools, 13 of those are um, Title I schools. We also have four other schools that we partially filled their requests. Um, we have more deliveries scheduled for this week. Uh, two more Title I schools will be, I think, fulfilled today. And um, we ha again, we have 10,000 Chromebooks on order. The next delivery is expected either late this week um, or next week. And so that we're not just um, relying on those orders we have quite a few chromebooks that need repaired and so we had some contracted help they've already started that they are specifically working on repairing chromebooks so that some of the chromebooks that we have that are out of circulation can get back into circulation and go to schools um, and go to students right now i believe we have about 800 devices that that are in the queue to be repaired so we're going to get those back out to schools um, as quickly as possible next slide uh, some of the teacher tools um, that we talked about last time, uh, webcams are still the biggest requested item. Um, we have more that are, are arriving every week. I got a, two notifications today about shipments that we should have in the next couple days. I met with a vendor last week um, to order 300 more. So um, we're staying on top of that one um, fairly well. Uh, the, the supply chain of that is not quite as stressed as some of the others. Um, Bob, hold on. Christy, are you okay? Are you having technical difficulty? I, I didn't think I was, but it didn't seem like anybody could hear me, so I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I was just curious. Of our Title I schools, um, do we have any more Title I schools that need Chromebooks, or are the Title I schools taken care of? So we, we've taken care of about half of the Title I schools on the list, and so it's a kind of a two-part um, process in order to determine who needs Chromebooks and so we have records of the number of devices that have been assigned to schools and then because of all of the movement of the students over the summer and because of the way that we left the Chromebooks with devices we know that some of those numbers are a little bit off and so we've asked the schools to request um, devices based on the numbers that they're seeing as well because what we don't want to do is rely just on the systems and so we had one school that um, initially requested about 150 they up increased that a little bit later our numbers were showing that they only needed about 60 devices and so if we didn't have that kind of two-way process um, we would have probably just shipped them 70 devices and then they would have been short and so we're working on both of those things right now we have most of the elementary schools that are title one schools taken care of because remember like all of the csi schools which or all of the schools that were designated csi um, are predominantly title one schools those were already taken care of so if you look at the 13 um, plus those seven, six or seven, then we're up to 19, and I think we have 23 Title I schools. And so um, the initial schools that we took care of were, were those CSI schools and some of the um, Promise Academy schools, and so we had already taken care of those. So the vast majority of the Title I schools are already taken care of, um, 
Breckenridge was another one that um, should have gotten a shipment today. And so those are the are the first schools that we're taking care of. So the vast majority of those have been taken care of. The Title I schools from here on out to fill those first? We will as they make requests. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to balance is we don't want to keep a bunch of devices in storage in the warehouse to react to continuing changes in enrollment. And so we'll push those out. But each time that we get a new shipment in, we, we do look at those Title I schools first, not just the elementary schools. We also have um, some middle and high schools that are uh, some middle schools and a high school that's a Title I school. So we look at those um, across the board within the requests that have been made um, to make sure that we're taking care of the students who need it the most. Thank you. You know, I, I, I was going to say, just to piggyback a little bit off of um, Board Member Morris, uh, I, I just think, you know, when you think about our Title three title schools and Title I schools and those particular schools that really have the kids who are the most neediest, um, I think we need to make sure that we are making sure that we're having these conversations with administration, et cetera, so that we can properly be able to plan and execute really quickly. Because again, you know, we talk about going more virtual. If you can't go virtual, if you don't have the equipment to go virtual with, um, and, and, and causing more of a gap there as well. So. Okay. So, so um, is our the needs assessment that we're doing, um, is it just if kind of, if they, um, asked or are, are we doing any are, is our approach more reactive at this point or are we like reaching out and kind of doing a needs assessment and inventory uh, at each of these facilities so we've been doing watching inventory and communicating back and forth with both the school technology coordinators and principals for for months um, we watched that inventory even before nti um, that is something that we keep an eye on pretty closely we look at uh, we have systems in place that we can look at usage of devices, whether they're in the school or at home. Um, we have systems that look at Google Classroom impl or uh, usage, Canvas usage. So we, we have systems in place, and these were in place long before we did NTI, where we can look at the usage um, because we don't want to just react to um, requests without having some data to back them up because we've had requests in some cases um, that were well beyond what the actual needs were um, and so you know we we have to balance making sure that we have those devices ready and and having those on the shelf not being used so um, we do try to plan we do look at usage we look at um, enrollment I've got enrollment emails and looking at enrollment all summer long we work with Steve Hill on projections and to make sure that we have devices in a normal situation where they need to be ahead of time if possible thank you so with connectivity um, I just want to kind of give everybody a little bit of perspective of of the scale of the issue that we have so Whenever we started looking at, at providing hotspots to students, um, in the first about 16 weeks of that program, we had 550 requests for hotspots. That's an average of about 35 per week. In the last five weeks, we've had over 1,700 requests for hotspots. So we went from 35 requests per week to over um, 340 per week. And so, um, Whenever we started, I started looking back and kind of doing a post-mortem on what happened with hotspots and why um, we kind of ran out. It, really, on about the 4th of August is when we started seeing um, the spike in requests. So on the 4th of August, we had 100 requests for hotspots on that one day. And so we went from, you know, 35 a week to 100 a, a day. And on the 5th, we had 450 remaining hotspots from T-Mobile and 90 from AT&T. So we had over 500 hotspots. Um, about a week later, we got below that 500 mark. And so we started the process to order for more. So that was about a month ago today, actually. And so whenever we have that kind of spike, um, you know, 
I do take some responsibility that we didn't react quickly enough to that, but um, in some cases it's almost impossible um, to get the vendor mobilized and get those hotspots in, in place. So when we began that process to order more on the 14th, we got those in today, and so it takes about a month. Um, right now we have another 1500 on order which will go beyond all of the requests that we have um, by several hundred um, and we already have um, vendors anticipating more um, orders after that so um, after we have the 500 or so that um, we're receiving that order today and they're being configured those should be going out to schools on either wednesday or thursday so that they can get in the hands of students um, and then we'll have an additional 800 requests um, with 1,500 on order. So uh, we're working with a vendor to get those um, in place a little bit more quickly this time. Um, another thing that we're waiting on with connectivity is um, KDE had put out an RFP, and so we're right, waiting for the results for that. And one of the big things about that is it should help us have more options to provide students especially in rural areas where the hotspots aren't really effective just because the cell phone coverage is lacking or in some of the densely populated areas like apartment complexes and some of those things where the cell phone towers tend to get overloaded and you know we see this with cell phones with with any kind of device not just our hotspots and so um, the KDE RFP included wired access, satellite access, some other things that um, we just don't have contracts for right now to provide access into students' homes. So um, we're really looking forward to those um, results so that we can start working on other options for our families. I have been in contact with the Chamber of Commerce, and the Chamber of Commerce um, is reaching out to some business partners to look at options for providing access to students when they're not at home. Um, KDE guidelines kind of restrict us a little bit whenever the donations, whenever the access is being provided from the district to students. And so we're working with some partners um, to try to expand some of the options for, for areas that we can't necessarily provide um, access to. And so um, connectivity is, is probably one of the biggest issues that we have right now for our students. Um, we have more students that need um, connectivity than we ever had in the past. And so we're working as diligently as we can um, to provide that access in a way that helps our students and helps our families. I'm going to pause and um, ask if there's any questions about connectivity because that's a, I know that's a big issue. We've had a lot of emails about it, and there's a lot of communication and questions about that. Mr. Moore, my, my only question is, have we looked at or is this even a feasible option? I know in some districts, and, and we've even done it um, where I teach, um, where you can uh, put a uh, hotspot uh, in a school bus and drive the school bus into a you know a community park or at uh, even an apartment complex or something like that uh, to provide access uh, to students um, through their devices is that an option or for us is that something that's feasible or is that more or less just in rural places so one of the things that we we have looked at that um, one of the interesting things is I've actually been working on that type of project for about eight years now uh, putting Wi-Fi on bus for us in Fayette County it's not um, quite as feasible one of the things that we have in this district is our schools are a lot more um, the distance between our children and our schools is a lot less than a lot of rural communities and so um, at our schools, we have a lot more robust wireless infrastructure, and um, all of our schools, you can use the Wi-Fi outside. And so whenever, if you look at a William Wells Brown area, if we that area is so compact that even putting a, a bus in the community um, doesn't necessarily increase access because the students still have to leave their house. Um, they still end up exposed if the weather is bad, if it's hot, if it's raining. And so... Um, while we have that ability, 
um, it's just not as feasible for us as it would be um, in some of the other districts. In Madison County, whenever I was down there, it's a very large geographical district. Um, the distances between home and school are a lot greater, and so that was one of the things that we did look at down there um, in the past. But for Fayette County, it's it's just not quite as as feasible to spend money and time um, in order to to provide a benefit that um, isn't quite as great as it would be in a rural area. You know, we look at, at um, library spaces, our school spaces, some of the free Wi-Fi downtown, as we kind of develop the map of where our students can get access. And so for us, just the, the time and the effort is best spent on providing access to students where they are rather than asking them to come to another space where a bus or something like that's parked. No, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, next slide, Amy. Again, just looking at student and family support, our help desk is um, exceptionally busy. Uh, we know that um, as we were looking at our support, one of the things that um, we had a lot of comments on was the wait time. So one of the things that we've done is we've added a little bit of intelligent routing to our phone calls so that when a, a parent or a student, a family calls in with something simple like a password reset, um, they can go ahead and hit a button. They'll get routed to somebody that is handling specifically password resets because those calls are very, very quick. Um, that way, if somebody with a more complex issue um, gets routed to a more senior tech, the passwords resets, they don't have to wait on hold for 10, 15 minutes for a two-minute phone call. And we've seen our um, wait times come way down. We look at... Um, the number of phone calls that we're taking, we look at the number of abandoned phone calls, which is, that's the number, the people who are on hold and then end up hanging up. And so we look at all of those things and we're making adjustments as we go to try to make sure that we're taking care of families in the best way possible. We're also doing that with staff members as well. We have a staff um, member phone number for a help desk as well. And so uh, we look at that um, and that's kind of been the biggest complaint that we've heard was the wait times and so right now those wait times are down um, considerably both due to the the processes that we've put in place and to, the volume of calls is just going down some of the most common things that we saw over the past um, week or two have a lot of them have really been kind of standard beginning of the year type things um, you know hardware issues on the devices that have sat around for a while password resets because somebody's forgotten them and so um, while some of the other types of issues make the news or are the ones that people talk about um, most of the volume that we're seeing have been fairly routine um, for our our types of uh, calls that we're getting looking forward over the next couple of weeks um, we delayed some of the school setup type stuff just because um, we wanted to focus on the virtual and NTI um, support. So we're going to get back into the swing of things there to make sure that the, the classrooms are all set up and they have the technology that they need. We've done a lot of that because some of the teachers are already back in the classroom. Another thing that we're really looking at is if we do go to a hybrid format, the classroom technology is going to be um, extremely important. So how teachers connect the students in the school building and at home, webcams in classrooms rather than just assigned to people, those types of things. And so looking at how teachers teach in a hybrid environment is something that we're really looking at. And then another thing that we're looking at is how do we support both the teachers and students in the school and the students that are at home because that is a pretty heavy lift whenever we essentially um, while we're not doubling the number of students that we have, we are vastly increasing the number of locations that we support. And so one of the things that we're looking at there, again, you know, going back to the contracting for um, Chromebook repairs, we're looking at how we can contract some of the lower level technical tasks so that our technicians who know our district, know our students, know our teachers can really focus on those higher level, level support needs that we have um, and really make sure that our support is being focused in the correct places rather than having our highly skilled technicians um, taking care of tasks that we can contract out for a much lower rate and uh, that we can really focus where we need to be. Um, next slide. I believe that's it. 
Any questions? All right, thanks, Bob. Greatly appreciate it. Um, Madam Chair, you talked about the classwork and assignments. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's a different, it's a different topic. Okay, because I, I do have Sharon and Kate to talk about um, what the expectations are. Um, obviously, we've been getting feedback from families about um the the varying degree of classwork assignments etc um and one of the things that we're doing is working with our school leaders to work with their families and collect that data at the school level because now it's being more impactful and i know we have uh, principal uh, josh williams who's uh, with us this afternoon or this evening um, that can talk about the work that he's, an example of that is the work that he's doing at Brenda Cowan. Well, one thing I will say on this topic and then um, is in my, what I've been saying to parents is, is be patient. And I know in some of my emails that I've responded to people, I've taken off my um, school board hat and put on my mom hat, for example. Uh, you know, I have two first graders at two different schools and they, um, their days look different than they had different requirements and they had different things. And as time has gone, they've leveled more similar. And I think, you know, what I, I've told parents and grandparents and caregivers is, you know, we're still evolving. We're still changing. Um, one of my daughter's schools, I have a second grader as well. They haven't started their reading small groups and their math small groups yet because they're still assessing and they're still doing things. So right now there's like a two hour dead period during the day where they're doing imagine learning and they're kind of playing, but that's because we're building up to having more time. Um, and so I think, you know, if parents are saying my kid's not doing anything, you know, make sure that, you know, talk to communicate to the teacher because what you may be missing is, oh, this is going to be small group time starting next week, or this is going to be this time during next week. Um, you know, and communicating, you know, if you're not going to be there for the day, if you have a doctor's appointment, you know, hey, I'm going to watch this asynchronously later, you know, just that constant communication and constant and know that we're all learning together and this is all shifting. Um, well, and think... that's just kind of my point on this, on this topic. The other topic is just really short, kind of a policy and procedure. Um, and I think Mr. Love and I have talked about that a little. We just want to share. We want to share. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, stay, I'll stay with this one and let uh, Sharon and Kate sort of weigh in and they want to build or expound upon what you just uh, stated. And then um, we'll turn over to Josh to talk about how things are going as a um, as an example, uh, Brenda Cow and how schools making those uh, those adjustments in real time. And uh, I don't know if Josh has his sort of survey data um, available or the survey questions because he did reach out to his family just to get a sense from them on what's working with NTI 2DL implementation at Brenda Cowan specifically and how they meet the needs of their of their families and what are some areas uh, for uh, continuous growth and so uh, Sharon if you want to weigh in or Kate. Uh, good evening everyone. So I first have to apologize if my uh, system kind of gives me a little bit of trouble. I'm having trouble at my home. Uh, but what I wanted to share is that um, we took a lot of the, we took the data and the, the surveys that we, um, that we captured information with in the spring or after our March uh, NTI experience. And we took that and, and built upon, uh, started working right then to improve the instruction that our children would be receiving as we move forward. With that in mind, we had uh, our three R teams to work very hard to come up with uh, instructional pieces that would impact our teachers and train them and help them to be ready for this new virtual, our virtual reality that we are experiencing. So I had stopped by Brenda Cowan and a couple other schools and was just kind of checking it out, seeing how it's worked. The best way to find out how things are going is to see it in real time. And so I stopped by Brenda Cowan and, and Josh said, come in, Miss Morton, let me show you what I'm doing. And it just kind of like, blew my mind. It was just amazing because he's in his school and just about any school in the district, I'll hang my hat on that. They're doing the exact same thing. 
and the beauty of it is, is thank you very much board and, and to those who were able who who agreed with us to to set our calendar up this year that from august the 10th to august the 14th all of our teachers were trained in the same manner with the same pd so that as they're rolling out the information and the, the the teaching and instruction that they're using it really very much looks the same it's kind of like board member spire said it's leveling off and you're beginning to see some commonalities there but i thought josh and uh, brenda cowan and their staff and what they're doing was something I wanted to share this uh, this evening. I wanted you to get a first-hand look at it, because, and parents also, those from the community that are watching, to understand what this looks like, because it's, it's huge. And our principals were giving just a nugget of information along with the teachers, but because of their focus and their intentionality and wanting to improve the instructional piece and make it be as, as, uh, as, as, as valuable as possible can, in this situation, if you see it, it's just amazing. So Josh Williams, principal of Brenda Cowan, take it away. All right, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, board. Um, thank you, Ms. Morton. Uh, and thank you, Superintendent Culp. Um, I'm excited to kind of show some of the things that we have going on at Brenda Cowan. Um, and, this, and what I'm gonna share is reflective of the work that we put in at Brenda Cowan to ensure that 2D, uh, NTI and 2DL is successful and highly engaging and to ensure that our students are learning at high levels. But I know that all of my principal colleagues yeah. and our schools have worked just as diligently to create a, a successful learning environment for all of our students. And so I'm, I'm extremely proud of the work that our district has done. Uh, I really feel like we've been on the cutting edge of reimagining learning. And so, I, so I'm grateful to be able to share some of the stuff that we've done at Brenda Cowell. And so um, the presentation here, we have our 2DL. So we understood coming out of NTI that we really had to reimagine what learning was and, and really improve on what we started with NTI. So we had, we had time to actually plan for it. And our teams really worked hard to make sure that we created a successful plan. So one of the first thing we started with was, was, was with our family survey. So if, Amy, if you could click on that. So we gave a, a survey to the parents to see um, how the experience was and what we could do differently to kind of improve the NTI uh, process and some, some of the takeaways that we got. And we got great feedback from our parents. Uh, one of them was student feedback uh, throughout the process. And so as we created our schedule um, for our 2DL schedule, we, inc we included times for intentional feedback for students. So right now, our teachers are using that time that's in their schedule to actually do guided reading assessments for our kids. So they're doing one-on-one -on -one reading assessments to get the reading levels of our students and creating individualized plans for every student. And the expectation is our students continue to learn and grow during NTI, and we feel like we were successful in kind of creating this plan. Um, so that's the survey, and we're actually we're actually sending uh, a no another survey out uh, Wednesday, and I'm following that up. We're following that up with a parent forum. So we're having a community forum. Uh, we started it. We did one last month to get feedback from parents, and our teachers were all, were involved. Um, and we've changed instruction because of that, and also just to put our parents in the loop on what we know because we are in this together, and we understand what they're going through, and so. And it takes a it takes a it takes a village. So we're family, and so we got the feedback, and from there we kind of created our plan. So um, one of the things that the parents also wanted was to make sure that we're adequately communicating everything that's going on in a timely manner. And one of the ways we did that was really revamping our social media. Amy, if you could click on that. Um, and so everything that's BCE, that's Brenda Cowan, you can find on our social media from, we have, if you scroll down, Arts and Education Week. So that's one of our scholars there presenting on, um, this is Arts and Education Week, what arts means for her. Um, if you can just keep scrolling down. Um, we did our, um, we did a, a Top Dogs Award based off our PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Intervention System. And so uh, every Friday I do home visits to our top dog, uh, social distancing, but I present that award to our kids. Um, and our kids have been very engaged. Um, when we look at our attendance, because of the COVID, 
we haven't seen a drop in attendance. So our kids are engaged. They're there. They're learning. They're present. Um, if we can go back. Um, we also did our we did our drive through open house, but we did a virtual open house for our family. So if you can click on the virtual open house. And so this was all things BCE. So if you're a parent, you're new to the school, um, there is everything that you need to know is in this virtual open house. So if you can click on welcome back, um, it starts with our video. If you can click on the welcome back video, and we're not going to go through the whole video, but you can just play like 10 or 15 seconds of it. Oh, that's the wrong video. That's the that's the that's the actual like music video we did for our families. If you can go back though, well, uh, where it says click at the top, click here, welcome video. <laughs> I love it. Hello, welcome to Brenda Cowan Elementary. My name is Mr. Williams and I'm the principal. We are so glad to have you here at Brenda Cowan. Here at Brenda Cowan we have our four pillars. We have our third grade reading pledge, arts integration, global competency, and service leadership. So come join me and we will be glad to give you a tour. All right, so you can stop it there. And welcome to your but um, we, we, give a, we give a tour to our families, a virtual tour, and in there also there's a message from every teacher. There's their classroom dojo set up, and there's also a video from the teacher, a welcome video as well as a welcome letter. So if you can go back to the presentation. Um, we, we also, like I said, in our schedule, we created times for conferencing with parents. Um, and we, we also included our family newsletter. And so that goes out uh, every month. And it's, and it's also all our resources that our parents need to be successful. And you can just click on that for a glimpse. So this was the most recent one we did. Um, and it talked about uh, our parent forum that we're going to be doing to get their feedback. Um, and, and it thanked our families uh, for showing us grace and helping uh, collectively and collaboratively to make sure that we get off to a great start uh, to the school year. And then, so we can go back. Um, and then also we re-imaged our website. So if you can go to the grade level website, so if you go to Brenda Cowan's, uh, our district website, um, it's, it's re-imaged to, uh, to be friendly for families. So, they can get on there, students or parents, they can get on there that they can see what lessons going on with ELA, with social studies, with math. Um, they also have Meet the Teachers, they have Q&A. We have our newsletters that go up weekly. Um, anything, the schedules, anything that our parents need, we want to make sure that we're accessible to them. And we have that for all of our grades. Um, then going to the next page. Um, and so with the survey, we also gave a survey out to our fam uh, to our teachers to see what they need. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But we also created, and this is what uh, one of the things we're proud of, is our Google count, our Zoom calendar. So if you can click, well, we're not going to click on that. But in the top right, we have a, a calendar, a uh, Zoom calendar that has every Zoom that goes on in the building. And so as an administrator, I can hop in and out of every Zoom, every classroom in the mornings, and I do to make sure that I'm giving teachers feedback uh, on how their instruction is going and helping them to identify high-yielding instructional strategies and also to celebrate them. The, my teachers, are, all of our teachers, have worked extremely hard uh, to make sure that this is the best learning environment that we have for our kids. And I would venture to say they put in more time than they would if we were in person, but our kids are worth it. And so I'm proud of the teachers for that. Um, any meeting we have is in that Google, is in that um, calendar. So I can go in and I can see a guided reading group. I can see small group guided reading, or I can see one-on-one -on -one instruction or whole group synchronous instruction um, and be able to give teachers feedback to allow them to continue to grow 
um, as educators and, and allow us to continue to meet the needs of our students. Um, and based off the survey, we also created our in-house professional development, if you can click on that. And so the district provided wonderful professional development and it helped our staff tremendously. And, uh, and there were additional stuff that our teachers wanted where they were resources. So they provided this in-house professional development based off their skills, their strengths, and their exp expertise. And so collectively, we worked together to make sure that we met all the needs. So we had our social emotional training, additional um, 2 di um, We had our guided reading training for all of our grade levels and things of that nature. Um, you can click the next one. Um, and with our presentation, we wanted to make sure we spent time looking at analytics to ensure that um, that our when we looked at our messaging, the the messages that were more visually appealing, the had greater response rates. So we wanted to make sure that we did that with everything that we sent out, so parents could really um, get involved and look at it and um, understand what we're communicating. If you go to the next one. And I think it's the last one. So these are just uh, some student supports that we offer for families with social emotional learning and things of that nature. And every pa family has access to this. And if you go to the last one, I believe it's the last slide. Well, we have two more. Um, we also wanted to ensure that we create enrichment opportunities that mirror that in the building. So we, we're doing, because we're arts integrated, uh, we focus we're still doing a play. So last week, our kids submitted their audition tapes virtually for the play. So we're going to do a virtual play, and it's called Illuminate. And I think it really speaks to this, this environment and the fact that we have the opportunity to do that. Um, we still do on Friday our Creative Arts Zooms, and, we have, and it's not mandatory, but we have a tremendous uh, participation from our students, and it's live. And we also do our BCE curbside library, and a lot of our families take uh, participate in that as well. And then the last slide, I believe the next one, is in conclusion, uh, one of the, the fo our focus is we want to make sure that we're communicating with families and it's open. They're communicating with us. We understand uh, their frustrations, but we're in this together and we're a resource and we're going to get through this. Um, we want to make sure that we're flexible and that we have to be creative in this new learning environment. And then last is, I tell my staff, and this actually came from uh, uh, Ms. Sharonda Morton, is being able to show grace. Um, we ask our families for grace. I ask, and I ask my supervisors for grace. And I, and, I, and I try to show grace to my teachers because we understand that this is unprecedented at times. But also, we, we do understand that our kids deserve to learn. And whether we're in person or we're digital, they're going to learn and they're going to continue to learn at high levels. And so that's my presentation and I thank you all for the time. Thank you, Josh. So now you understand why I wanted him to share today. You see a lot of, you see a lot of this throughout the district and one of the things that Josh had shared that was important to me is that he said his colleagues, it's been a collegial uh, effort. Everyone is talking to each other, one band, one sound. How can we help each other? What are you doing over here to get the message out? What are you doing here? And so you see this, this kind of commonality throughout the district. It may look a little different, but ultimately, it's like you said, we are trying to meet the needs of our kids in this virtual reality. We're learning. We're uh, through this process. We make great gains and changes since March, of which I'm very proud of for all of my schools and what they're doing and the conversations that have come about the three R's reimagining and renewing and, and, and doing education and looking at it differently. So when our students are back into our schools, whether it's hybrid, whether it's it's uh, all in person, whatever it is, that still that level and that uh, focus will continue even as we transition from whatever, it, we're prepared. We are preparing ourselves to make these transitions throughout the year, that was our goal. And, God, uh, and Josh is a, uh, a really good example of that. So thank you, Josh, for, for being here representing not just Brendan Cowan, but the schools and the teachers and your colleagues in the, in the, throughout the district. And we thank you, you totally rock, as well as my other schools. Everyone's doing an awesome job. Thank you. Superintendent. And Josh, great job. Great job. Uh, and Sharonda, again, for sharing what the experience is like. And that's why we try to make sure that there is that personal connection between school and home. And so that schools are responsive 
Um, love the fact that you're showing grace, asking for grace for families, but also showing grace to our colleagues. And so, um, and keeping students engaged, even in this uh, virtual uh, learning experience in this setting. All right, um, any questions before we continue to move on? I, I do have a quick, quick question. I think, I don't know if Ms. Morton is the correct one to address this to. And, and before I ask the question, though, I will say that uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Williams, for the presentation. It speaks to, I mean, our teachers are really uh, working hard. And, um, you know, I, I, speaking as an educator, none of us uh, prefer this over in-person learning. I mean, at the end of the day, right? There are, teachers want to be back in the classroom. and But we understand the situation. And I think they've made the... Uh, they made the best of it, uh, despite the circumstances. They're really working hard, and we appreciate that work. Um, on that point, uh, Ms. Morton, on, I've gotten some questions about Imagine Learning uh, from some families and educators. Uh, what is our status on that? I, I, there may have been some rough patches, and um, is that just on, on a school-by-school -school basis? Is that district-wide training that we're providing for that, or is that just uh, a school school-by-school? Well, Ms. McIntyre uh, came in for that one, so go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Kate. Uh, Board Member Murphy, the Imagine Learning is available for all schools, um, actually preschool through eighth grade. And it is uh, a tool that we started using this summer. And we, are, uh, we purchased it to help also support learning this school year as well. So that actually is an option for all of our schools, preschool through eighth grade. So is this one I can jump in on real quick because this is me as a mom. Um, I've had some of these complaints as well too, but my kids started using it back in June and they do an hour a day. And I did it all summer with them and just made it expectation because I didn't want them to go from NTI in the spring to whatever we were doing now and then be like, what's going on. So they just done an hour every day. It, I understand the bumps, bumps. I think the assessment is a little, um, you know, I know for one of my kids, I felt the assessment was a little higher level, but I, what I've told parents is just let them do it and don't answer because it works itself out. And what's oh. great about it is it's self-motivating. Like as they get more advanced, they get more, you know, advanced. All my kids improved in reading this summer. Um, and to the point where at the beginning of the summer, they were not reading any books independently. My two first graders and my second grader are reading independently. Um, and I think it's a great tool for parents is what I've told them. You know, my kids um, think it's a video game. So, you know, if I need to go make dinner or during the day, even sometimes, like if it's still during school hours and I have to take a conference call or a doctor's appointment, I just put them on Imagine Learning. So my, my advice to families is just keep plugging with it because as a family that's been doing it for three months, four months now, my kids love it. I love it. I don't have to do anything with them about it. And it actually, I have seen them advance. So that's what, you know, that, and I have, as I've told parents that they seem to be like, okay, let's give it a shot. Cause I think there's some thought of like, what is this program? It's just filling time. It's just not, you know, like we're not teaching. You're just putting them on a video game or whatever. You know, I think it takes them off of those Zooms. It takes them away, but it really, it's a good program. Like I can, I have seen it work firsthand over the summer. Um, and so I just want to communicate that to families and to maybe Mr. Murphy as well. Um, Cause I think if you don't use it, you don't know. And I know sometimes like programs I'm not using, like I, one of the, High schoolers asked me about a program that I don't use because I don't have a high school. And I was like, well, give me your, let's log in together and show me what you're talking about. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. And um, board member Murphy, if um, I can be of any assistance to help navigate some of those issues, I'll be uh, send them my way. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so we'll just refer folks. I, I was just making sure we had the right point of contact on that. And the fact that it is maybe new and that especially that some teachers are just trying to implement it into a virtual instruction setting may yes. also create some hurdles, but then yes. um, some are using it as uh, an assessment Mills, tool. Uh, BJ, Mindy Mills was the one who actually was uh, overseeing it over the summer during our summer bridge or summer learning program. And um, um, uh, BJ Morton has also stepped up to, and helped this school year. So any of the three of us could definitely help uh, teachers or parents um, uh, with, that, with that program. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. 
All right. So next I ask um, Byron Thompson, our Chief Operating Officer, to come forward and share uh, this month's uh, monthly construction report. We'll, we'll do that at the regular meeting, Manny. You got it. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right, so board, next on the agenda for the meeting on the 28th will be our consent items. Our chief financial officer, Mr. John White, and operating officer, Myron Thompson, are available if you have any questions about the awards and bids or proposals. All right, seeing no questions. Once again, our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Myron Thompson, uh, can respond if you have any questions about the declaration of surplus and intent to sell. Here, no questions. We'll continue. There's a placeholder for post approvals that Finance Director uh, Roddy Jackson will report at the action meeting on the 28th. Uh, seeing that there's no questions, uh, Finance Director Rodney Jackson can also respond any questions you may have about our special and other leave of absences. All right, seeing if there's no questions, our finance director, Rodney Jackson, can also respond to any questions uh, that you have about, no, excuse me. Uh, next, we have um, six construction related consent agenda items. Once again, our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Myron Thompson, is available if there are any questions. I see that there's no questions. Next on our planning meeting agenda, we have several items for your consideration and action this evening. Uh, first, we're seeking your approval of a BG1 project application for the purchase of 100 Midland Avenue this is just a part of the multi-step process required by the Kentucky Department of Education. Our Chief Operating Officer is available, or Mr. Myron Thompson, uh, once again, if you have any questions. If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve a BG1 project application for the purchase of 100 Midland Avenue for the amount of $7,644,997. Subject to approval of the Kentucky Department of Education District Facilities Branch per the provision 702 KAR 4160. Not everybody at once. I move to approve the BG1 application. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I second. A second by Mr. Love. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, board. Our next item for your consideration is the approval of the BG1 project application for the purchase of 2185 and 2345 Polo Club Boulevard. Our chief operating officer, Mr. Myron Thompson is available respond to any questions that you may have. I do know Chair, I move to approve the BG1 project application for purchase of 2185 and 2345 Polo Club Drive, Club Boulevard. Subject to the approval of the Kentucky Department of Education District Facilities Branch per the provisions of 702 KAR 4160. We have a motion by Mr. Daniels. I'll second. Second by Ms. Murphy. Any further discussion? Ms. Morris. Mrs. Morris, sorry, I just married you all. <laughs> I apologize. Sorry, Mrs. Morris. I also said Miss Murphy, so I don't know who that was. All right, Mrs. Morris, thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, board. The next item for action tonight is the approval of a contract with Hewitt Versafit Technologies. 
Director of Grants Research Accountability and Data, uh, Dr. Billy Buchanan is here to answer any questions that you may have. If there are no further questions, the recommendation is in order to approve the renewal of the contract with Hunit. Say that again, who knew it? Who knew it? Yes, who knew it? Who knew it? I'll make a motion to approve the renewal of the contract with who knew it. Thank you, Mrs. Morris. Is there a second? I'll second. Second, second by Mr. Daniels. All in favor, or any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you, board. Our next action item this evening is seeking your approval a request from principals for extended field trips. Our school chiefs are available to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for the staff at this time? If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the extended trips requested as listed. I'll make a motion to approve the extended trips request as listed. So motion by Mrs. Morris. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Daniels. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Our next action item is the adoption of the tax rates for the fiscal year 2020-2021. With us to provide additional details tonight are our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. John White, Director of Finance, Mr. Rodney Jackson, and Director of Budget and Financial Planning, Ms. Ann Sampson. That's not totally correct since Ann is newlywed and just got married. Um, uh, but uh, I'll let her share that. <laughs> the married name part, I forget the, 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 your spouse's name, your, your new surname. But uh, Ann Sampson, can you do the presentation? On August 20th, um, 2020, the district received our, from the Department of Property and Tax Department of Education certified net assessments, growth, and tax rates calculates provided by KRS 135. 134, excuse me, dot 590, section 7, 157.440, 160.470, and 160.463 for the 2021 school year. The current rate is 81 cents per 100 for real estate and 76 cents per $100 for property, personal property. Staff recommends that the board approve a rate of 81 cents for real estate and 76 cents for personal property. Following are the certified tax rates per 100 assessed valuation, which may be levied for 2021. The compensating rate was 81 cent, 81.1 and 81.1 for both real and personal. The other rate, which we propose is 81 cents and 76 cents, keeping it flat. And a 4% increase is 84.3 and 84.3. The tender budget approved in May was predicated on no inc tax increase this assumption was made in consideration of the current nationwide pandemic and, and economy. Staff believes that levying the other rate appears appropriate at this time at 81 cents and 76 cents, which is no increase is flat. Are there any questions or concerns? Any If there are no further questions or recommendations in order that the Board of Education for 2020-2021 levies a total rate of 81 cents real estate and 76 cents personal property per 100 assessed valuation and a total motor vehicles property rate of 59.2 cents per 1,000 assessed valuation in preparation of the working budgets for school year 2020-2021. Do I have a motion? So um, I move to set the tax uh, rates as advised. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Thank you. Second by Mr. Daniels. Do you have any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 
Any All right. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, thank you, board. Our next action item is the award of request uh, for proposal for thermal temperature monitoring. Director of Risk Management and Safety and Security, Joe Isaacs, is here tonight, along with our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Myron Thompson, to answer any questions you may have. And again, this is for thermal temperature monitoring. And as we talk about Board Member Murphy and Board Member Morris getting prepared, for post 28, uh, this is something that um, we want to make sure we have implemented. It's a sign of the times that we that we got uh, what 23 proposals uh, for this. Uh, is this so? As what the fiscal impact that we're looking at is that the numbers we're seeing under evaluators is that the cost? Is that is that what that is, or is that the score? No, no, that's the, well. The cost is for this is Joe Isaacs. Uh, the cost for thirty-five cameras. That's what we're kind of estimating, and it would be about three hundred eight thousand dollars. Okay, and would those be paid for out of our ESSER or COVID relief funds, or is that just do we know yet? Correct. It should be paid out of our COVID relief funds. Okay, thank you. We're going to try to bill it. Oh, I see it. I see it on the second page, the 308. I see it right here. I just didn't scroll down all the way. Did you all get the number? I'm just curious. Um, when you went to go see Toyota, was this what they were using? Or had you been able to try out the equipment somewhere else? We looked at several different versions. Um, we looked at some kiosk type of cameras, and that would be if you walked up and would kind of scan your face and then you would kind of walk away. We thought that would be a little bit too slow for our folks because that would, uh, it's almost a second to take your temperature. It's almost a second to uh, reset itself. So we went to Toyota, and Toyota was using a, a camera from Amcrest that we liked uh, very much. And so that's kind of what we went back and developed our RFP. But uh, BCI came in with uh, better pricing and could deliver the cameras when needed. So that's why we went with uh, BCI over Amcrest. Thank you. If there are no further discussions, recommendations in order to approve the award recommendation for RFP 3420 Thermal Temperature Monitoring to BCI Integrated Solutions. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Love. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Mrs. Morris. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you, board. That was the last of our action items this evening. We also have some informational items for uh, to share with you. First, the placeholder for the 2021 working budget. Uh, here to provide details, our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. John White, and Director of Budget and Financial Planning, Ms. Ann Sampson. Hey, Mr. Um, Superintendent Cox. Uh, Ms. Is, is there a professional leave? Oh, miss, okay. I I see that, but I didn't see any language. Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't sure. That's why I was double checking. Yeah, let me. Let me ask the team, check with the team, but let me. No let items know. this month. There is no <laughs> items this month. That's what I thought, but we that's wanted what, to be sure. That's yeah, why perfect. I thought, just making sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Cock, board members. Um, thank you, Superintendent Cock, for the introduction. Um, I recently got married, so I'm now hyphenating. So I'm Ann Sampson Grimes. I'm uh, working on something updated. <laughs> As many of you may know, that, that takes a little bit, and especially during this uh, this climate, it takes a little bit longer. So but thank you for the kind introduction. We're really excited, and I'm super excited to be a member of the Fayette County um, Board of Education team 
and being here for support for our students and staff. One of the things that um, I think is important for um, everyone to know is that my team and I are engaged with the schools every day. Um, I've had the fortunate opportunity to work in the schools, uh, provide mentorship to some students throughout my career, uh, help boost them up and provide them with the next generation skills that they need and in interviewing and um, business acumen. And I've really enjoyed being a part of that and really working closely with our principals and directors. It's important that we're involved and that's just, um, you know, we try to make sure that they have all the tools that they need to be successful as professionals um, and really just support our staff, our students and our families and making sure that they have everything, particularly during this, this, uh, this climate. So we'll move on to the next slide. As you know, the board is charged with approving the uh, working budget, which adjustments have been made to the tentative budget. The working budget finalizes everything for any unfunded mandates and any additional grant funds that have been received or any adjustments in the tax rate. So this budget projects for the um, tax rate just approved by the board. Next slide, please. Revenue changes from the tentative that uh, the board saw in May, the beginning fund balance uh, increased by um, 8.6 million. So the projected fund balance increased from what will soon to be finalized by the auditor. So this is still a moving number, but it's a very close estimate to where we will be with our beginning fund balance increase from last year. The real and personal property decreased by 1.6 million. Motor vehicles stayed fairly static. We noticed in the trends, we do a, a market analysis to see where everything is at for real and personal property, motor vehicles, utilities, and all of our other revenues. We noticed that the motor vehicle um, sales are catching up to the budgeted amounts. So those stayed roughly the same. No change in utilities revenue this year. There will probably be changes uh, this upcoming year, given that more people are working from home. Um, the occupational tax license, there was no change in that estimation there. It was pretty spot on with what was projected. The uh, projected interest increase is 525,000. Bus rental was estimated to be roughly half because of the current climate. We, uh, we cut that in half for the projection. Miscellaneous revenue, um, just odds and ends surplus and general sales for the district, um, we increased it by 90,000. And as the board is fully aware, the SEEK will fluctuate given up enrollment. So we noticed a decrease um, in the projection of 733,000 versus what was last year final and what was the new forecast for 2021 uh, school year. And on behalf of payments, simple in and out, um, that's just money we need to account for based on what we receive for benefits. And we estimated the change to be 3.7 million for a total net change of 9.8. Next slide. Thank you. Um, in addition to contingency items approved in May, the beginning balance um, has the following obligations. As everyone knows, we have a section six carry forward. So we allow the schools to carry forward um, 10%. And this amounts to $1 million. Last year was difficult for the schools to be able to spend what money was allocated. So their carry forward was just a little bit more this year, which amounts to about a million dollars. We have not made second month adjustments. The team and I are in discussions with the leadership within the district to make a determination as to whether or not we're gonna make any changes. Typically, we take an enrollment measurement to see if it increased or decreased based on what we projected last year, but this year is completely different. And so we're keeping it steady until we have um, more discussions. Next slide. In the working budget, this carries forward to what was included in the tentative budget. We have the girls uh, K-8 STEM program, which amounts to $1.9 million. The STEAM Science Lab at $50,000. Uh, Locust Trace Partnership at thirty two. dollars The anticipated utility increase uh, was roughly estimated to be $125,000. Kiss the debt service, there's always an increase in, in debt service at $168,000. Um, always insurance increase. Um, with the uh, fluctuations, those always go up and down every year based on need, 110,000. Um, increase of student 504 at 20,000 and then portables to relieve overcrowding. You know, the district is working on um, you know, purchasing property and different facilities to be able to help alleviate that. But right now for the portables, it amounts to uh, 347,000. Uh, transportation increase of 490,000 and then the um, salary experience debt for our staff to retain high quality ta talent for our district and uh, maintain our talent for the district to help support our students and families. We're estimated to be uh, $3.1 million. 
and the beginning fund balance always allows for the fluctuation in collection of tax revenue, which will fluctuate this year um, because we're in a different collection period based on um, just the change in the climate. So, next slide. As the board knows, the special revenue fund houses all state and federal grants, and this also includes local grants that are received. This is where our CARES Act funding is housed. Food service fund uh, is traditionally self-supportive, but given the realm of COVID, uh, we estimated two payrolls and benefits on top of that, which amounts to $2.6 million that has been earmarked in the general fund. If we see the need and the fluctuation, we will look at um, the CARES Act funding. Right now we have a spending plan for our CARES Act funding that includes instruction and tech technology to support our students and families. Um, so we allocated the money out of general fund, but if there is funding available, then we'll allocate that out of the CARES funding as well. And the capital outlay is funded at $100 per student as required. And fund 320 is for our building fund, our debt service, and um, those uh, facilities. This is the total for each of the funds in the working budget, roughly 575 for the general fund, 53 for special revenue, which includes our CARES Act funding. And the CARES Act funding um, in fund two, this fund two also includes the um, uh, security reimbursement funds as well. And then capital outlay of 3.6. This is the SEEK amount in our SEEK sheet, and that's reflected in the capital outlay fund. Building fund is our debt service amount for fiscal year 21. And then the um, fund balance for food service working budget will be 24 million for a total working budget of $693 million. Does the board or anyone have any questions? I just want one quick question, uh, Ms. Sanson Grimes, on the overall in the insurance, has COVID um, caused any of the increases for any of our other insurance, insurances that we have and coverage that we have? Um, and I estimate that it that it would, so that's why I built it into the budget. And auto, auto, and auto and and all of that, but just is that a, so that's a holistic look at all of our insurance increases. It is, and it's and it's a moving number because um, we're working with the procurement group to make sure that we are holding those costs down as well. I like to negotiate, so um, and I'll, I've told uh, previous boards that I don't pay retail for anything. So if we can negotiate our price down and be able to maximize our resources, that's what I value. That's important. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Ann, and congratulations once again, Ann. On, uh, thank you. <laughs> all right, on your nuptials and uh, uh, being a newlywed uh, and board. The agenda for the 28th also includes several informational items, including the placeholder for the monthly financial report, the placeholder for the school activity funds report and personnel changes for August. At this time, I will turn the meeting back over to you, Madam Chair, and we do have a need to go into closed session this evening. Thank you. Um, so we added an agenda item and um, a, about classwork assignments. And what we were referring to is we know that there have been um, some assignments that have made the media lately or that families have contacted us about um, of varying degrees at different schools. And first, we want to let you know that we are reading your emails and we have heard from you. Um, you know, the school board does not oversee um, the, um, does not oversee assignments at the school. Those are school-based levels that's, you know, we, we don't even do the curriculum and some things like that. But um, I wanted to give my, my fellow board members just the opportunity as well, because I know they had, some of them requested that we add this to the meeting to see if there was anything that they wanted to say or that they wanted to just kind of talk about, um, about assignments or if anybody wants to say anything. It's just a common misconception, so I'm glad you're bringing it up, but um, a lot of people do think that we're involved in those sort of day-to-day -day decisions, but um, anyway, as you say, those those are made at a school level, and 
um, I think just educating the public on that when we're approached with it is the right thing to do. And that was really my intent this evening was to make sure that the public knew that, you know, we aren't in the day to day weeds. You know, we are in the big picture. We are in the strategic plan. We are in the facilities we are in. Um, but, you know, at the same time, if you do have concerns, definitely bring it to our attention. Um, this is know. where communication is important. You know, if, don't hesitate to um reach out to a teacher and ask and you know maybe there's some context to a lesson or an assignment or something and it's always best to start uh start with the teacher and then if need be you know you can work your way up from there and typically i have found that most most matters are resolved when you know you you bring it to a bring it to a teacher and have that conversation and I think, you know, just going back over it, I think that is just the theme of all of this right now, Mr. Murphy, is go to your teacher. Whether you are feeling overwhelmed, where you're feeling underwhelmed, whether you don't understand an assignment, whether you think an assignment's out of context, whether you disagree with an assignment, you start with your teacher. And as you said, most of the time, it'll be resolved right at that level. Um, and, you know, we really want to, as a board, reiterate that we want you to communicate with your teachers and communicate there um, because they're on the front lines and they're the ones who know the, this, this stuff. So if no one else has anything else to say on that, then we will, hold on, I've got, um, then, hold on, um, before we go to closed session, I'll make a motion as, or a motion is in order to make the agenda dated September 14th, 2020, on which action has been taken at this meeting, a part of the minutes as if copied in the minutes verbatim. Do I have a motion? So moved. A motion by Mr. Love. Do I have a second? Second. A second by Mr. Murphy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five zero. And before I take the motion to go into closed session, um, Superintendent Cock, can you give us the insight? Is this going to be a short one? Like, do we need to have a movement break before, or can we just go straight into closed session? Um, it's going to be it's going to be a short one. But you know, I I would say you know what, take the movement break, and then join us. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right, so if you need a movement break, take a movement break. But the board has a need to go into closed session to KRS 61.8101B and C to discuss the future acquisition or sale of real property and propose or pending litigation. The board will reconvene an open session and, if necessary, take any action required pursuant to discussions conducted during closed session. I'll now entertain a motion to go into closed session. I'll make a motion to go into closed session. Motion by Mrs. Morris. I'll second. Second by Mr. Murphy. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We are now in closed session.
meet that human. I'm thinking you need some beads and plastic, plexiglass. There you go. That's what I'm thinking. I'm serious. Because after being under the weather, I want to get my COVID test again. But, you know, it's like, you know, what did governor say today? Come on. You got to make, as, as a board member Murphy, you understand these things. And the ages keep getting uh, younger and younger, it seems. Yeah. All right. So Mrs. Morris made a motion followed by Mr. Daniels to get us out of closed session. And so we are now back. Or the motion passed unanimously, 5 0. So we are now back in open session. And. With that, um, a motion is in order to revise the previously authorized purchase agreement of 46.93 acres at 2185 and 2345 Polo Club Boulevard to close on or before December 3rd, 2020 and provide for the establishment of the escrow account prior to closing the real estate transaction subject to the terms and conditions of the agreement and the approval of the Kentucky Department of Education. District Facilities Branch, per the provision of 702 KAR 4050. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Mrs. Morris, a second by Mrs. Mr. Daniels. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. A motion is ordered to make the agenda dated September. We already actually made this motion, Mr. Love. Okay. So we can take that out. So at this time, I'll have a motion to adjourn at 8, 10 p.m. I move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oops, I'm sorry. I was, I was just eager to uh, uh, adjourn. You are absolutely fine. A motion by Mr. Murphy, a second by Mr. Daniels. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned at 8, 10 p.m. Thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to follow up with us. And we will see everybody back at 6 p.m. on September 28th. Have All a right. great evening. Good evening. Thank you, board. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Bob.